Now it's time for text 6.1 from the Edexcel A-Level English Language and Literature Anthology, uh, which is The King's Speech uh, by David Seidler. And we'll actually look at the text, which is here. So we've got a bit of context. So you've probably heard of the film. You've probably seen the film. And uh, as it says, this is an extract from the screenplay of the King's Speech, uh, the British playwright, sorry, by David Seidler, the British playwright, film and television writer. So screenplay, just think of it, it's just a film script, that's all that means, just occasionally you hear that word instead of script. They say it at the Oscars and things like that, and they say like best screenplay and those kind of things. So um, the video after this one is the one on the uh, the radio play, and you can see some differences between that in terms of the layout. See, this is designed, it's a visual medium as well, so in terms of the context. And there's a few little extra things we can add there in terms of, uh, like in real life speech, there's things that are cut out, there's lots of elision, they're going to be, there's got to be lots of kind of simple sentences. We're going to see things like adjacency pairs, uh, we're going to see all these kind of things, maybe a bit of uh, colloquialisms. And those kind of things. We're going to see some features of real life speech, but we tend to, when you're writing like a, a, a script of any kind, you're going to cut out the boring bits you don't need. So this is just an extract. So presumably you've seen the film. I mean, you can find this sequence in the film if you want to have a look at that. Uh, and you can actually watch that. But we'll get straight down to talking about the actual text itself. So in terms of discourse structure... You've got uh, Lionel and Bertie, as it's the only two characters speaking in this scene. You've also got, um, it uses Bertie as in the informal name of, um, of well, later to be the king, um, played, by, um, played by Colin Firth. And you have... So the first line, you yeah, know any jokes. So you know that the, the premise, actually, if you don't know the premise, is obviously that there's um, a speech infirmity, or impairment, not infirmity, that's the wrong word, impairment, where Bertie stutters. And uh, he, so later to be uh, George the Sixth, of course, but at this point he's still a prince. So it's a little bit confusing in that way, but he's got a uh, a stammer, quite a serious stammer. So that's part of the context, which they don't actually tell you here. I think they just assume that you've seen the film. And Lionel, Lionel Logue, is the um, speech therapist that he ends up going to see. And he's the one that actually has success in helping him overcome the uh, the stammering. So there's all that little background there, which you may not have known. So for some reason, they don't tell you all of that stuff. So uh, there you go. So it opens up with, which I'll zoom in a little bit here. So it opens up a bit. And we've got uh, no any jokes straight away. So this isn't actually the start of the scene. This is just the start of the extract. But it opens with, we can actually add some terms in here, like elision in terms of, as in E-L-I-S-I-O-N, and the idea of we've got words left out, which is what we do in real life, and it's an interrogative as well. Then we've got the following line, we could describe this as a phrasal template, so timing isn't my strong suit. Uh, I say phrasal template because there's a lot of times you might say, this, this part's actually idiomatic, so isn't my strong suit. It's an idiom. It's it's really a, a, an idiom is a repeated metaphor taken from uh, it's a repeated metaphor that we use a lot to express particular ideas. And so strong suit really is borrowed from the world of card games. So timing isn't my strong suit, but you could have it as cookery isn't my strong suit or fashion isn't my strong suit or whatever you want it, whatever it to be. So that's why it's a phrasal template, because a phrasal template it follows the same pattern, and, and sometimes you you want to say familiar collocation, as in words that frequently go together. But you can get a bit annoyed with that as a term because you think, well, actually, that word changes. That's not always the same. This isn't familiar. We don't always go around saying timing isn't my strong suit. So that's when you use phrasal template. So it's quite a useful little term for those kind of repeated words and phrases, except where a word or a couple of words are different. So you could use it like that. So. That's quite a nice little line then as well. 
and uh, there's pragmatics at work here. So the implication is obviously he's there with his speech impairment, with his stammering, and he uh, the implication obviously that timing's not a good thing. He won't be able to tell any jokes because of because of his speech impairment, because of the stammering. Then we have um, stage directions, which are again a generic feature of screenplays, so of silence, they stare at each other. Now you might think a lot of this, you think, well, there's not a lot of detail to this script. You know, there's things, if you watch the film and you see that there's much more things happening, well, of course, this is the script by David Seidler, as it says here, and the there's other versions of the script that are used when you're making a television program or a film or whatever you'll use like there'll be a camera script later on and it'll tell you where the camera's meant to be and what the director's doing and what other things are going on so this is really just a dialogue really and a few kind of minimum minimal stage directions uh really and all the other stuff's going to be worked out later on by the actors and the director later on so that's actually part of the context as well then we have a colloquialism. Colloqu I can't even say it. Sorry, colloquialism here. Cup of tea. It's also written in a colloquial way, and this works in. If it was real life speech, it would be like a uh, politeness strategy. You offer someone you're talking to something, and then more politeness here again. You could apply your. Um, if you've heard of the super maxims, uh, the super maxim of politeness. We tend to dress everything up with these little polite phrases in life as we're talking so you could use super maximum of politeness there to cover some of these um, formalities and you could even it would even come into some fatic talk as well and then if i just move the screen up this is also oh, point i need a point this here this here i think i'll have one this is what's known as a self-oriented fatic token. This is when you. Um, I always find the funniest one is when you, when when people often say, oh, "Just put that in the bin." You know, if there's if there's other people in a room, uh, you're not really telling everyone that you're putting something in the bin. You're just acknowledging other people's presence there, and you're co keeping communication channels open. So. If you say, oh, I'm just going to put that in the bin and there's other people in the room, it means that they, you're, oh, I'm open to be talked to. You could just walk over to the bin and put the put the rubbish in the bin. You might wonder why I'm talking about bins. But the reason is it's because of this. He's making a cup of tea. I think I'll have one. It's a way of acknowledging and showing respect for the other person there. And actually part of the context as well, a lot of this, and also it's even the way the script is written, it's about Lionel as the speech therapist establishing a rapport with Bertie. He's trying to establish a rapport with Bertie where they're, where they're working as equals, aren't they, on an informal level. Because otherwise, if he acknowledges um, Bertie's status as a royal and is intimidated by that, they're never going to achieve anything. They're never going to help him in any way. So think about that. Then uh, stage directions again turns on the hot plate. Then we've got, uh, aren't you going to start treating me, Dr. Logue? You could talk about pragmatics here, as in the implication that he's not doing anything and that he's not happy with how this session is actually going straight away. You've got adjacency pairs here because there's question and answer, which is useful. We could mention that. So again, we've got to remember, we've got to be conscious of voice with this, haven't we? That's the thing we've got to remember as well. So think about the voice of Bertie and his dissatisfaction. You could think about that, how David Seidler is using these techniques to create this dissatisfied tone. And then Lionel's voice really is of him coming through as he's informal, but he's confident. There's an element of that as well coming through. So use these terms to support that idea of what they're like as characters. And, and more importantly as well, it's David Seidler. So for language and literature, you've always got to remember your extra marks are always coming through establishing how things work. How does the writer get the things to work? How, 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 how are they doing the things that you're pointing out? Don't just describe the stuff there. Ask yourself that. And it might take one or two extra sentences to establish how they're doing it. And you could even add extra terms in as you're explaining it. So you're going to boost your marks there as that way. Then uh, if we move down a little bit. And yeah, before we go on, I should have said as well, uh, there's you could talk about that as evocative. Bertie tries to, or David Seidler writing for Bertie, 
tries to establish the character of Bert, well the character of Bertie is trying to establish a level of formality that he is useful sorry not useful he is used to as a member of the royal family so he uses this professional vocative that term of address there is and with the honorific title of doctor actually as well as a bonus in pragmatic terms with a bit of extra knowledge of the film Lionel Logue isn't actually a doctor he just assumes that he is this this article doesn't tell you that uh, this extract, sorry, doesn't tell you that, but it's, you know, you might find that useful. Then, uh, probably the most important thing here is to say, yeah, we had adjacency pairs, but also look at this, please call me Lionel. Um, you've got an imperative there. And also, you could talk about how, if someone's trying to establish the terms of address in any conversation, that's a way of asserting power and control and defining the nature of that conversation. So there's another thing David Seidler does in this, and also in terms of voices, it's the two men um, verbally combating. It's not aggressive kind of verbal combat, but there is there is a, a power struggle, effectively, who's in control of this conversation. And you see, really, it's Lionel by it. You know, he's, he does a good job in resisting the things Bertie tries to do to establish control. And we can continue that theme with yeah, I prefer Doctor and I prefer Lionel. So there's parallel phrasing here where Lionel asserts, you know, I prefer Lionel. It's used, David Side has used a parallel structure to do that. So we have subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object. So you could use the same thing there so you can actually get that in. So that works quite nicely for what we were just saying. So just scroll that up a bit, then get the pointer back. Then, um, I prefer Lionel, what I call you, then Bertie, yeah, and he's using, again, this is this is the thing I was saying about names and titles and vocatives and terms of address, and if you're trying to establish these things, look, Bertie, your royal highness, then sir, after that, this is the formality, this is how you're meant to address a member of the royal family, this is the the, the etiquette, the appropriate way of addressing someone in that position. That Lionel actually dismisses this with a bit formal for here. So he actually uses informal speech here. A bit is colloquial, isn't it? For here, what about your name? Prince Albert Frederick Arthur George. So again, it's Bertie's trying to establish the formality. Lionel is establishing the opposite. And don't forget to say it's David Seidler, the writer, is doing this. He's creating these characters. It's based on a real event. But no one knows exactly what these two men really said to each other on these actual real life sessions all those years ago. So it's completely speculative. So it's fictionalised. It's fictionalised history, isn't it? It's mainly for entertainment. And it's a good film. How about how about Bertie? How about colloquial as well? Bertie, informal. It's an informal vocative. So Prince Albert Frederick Arthur George, he's choosing Bertie out of that. If you've actually watched the film and you've seen the sequence, a useful term for the talking in this extract is is when they get to this point of, you know, I prefer Doctor, I prefer Lionel, I said about parallel parallel phrasing or parallel structure. When you're getting these quick fire um, alternate lines, these adjacency pairs, you can borrow a term you may have learnt from Shakespeare or studying other drama and, you know, of stichomythia, which is a difficult word to spell, as I was spell it i have trouble spelling it myself but it's a great um it's a great term exchange these quick fire exchanges of lines it's a useful um it's a useful term so yeah it's um yeah it's a useful one. so stichomythia you can look that up and you can see that and that's useful we'll go on to the next page and here we are on the next page so let's have a look we'll zoom in a little bit and actually I need to get that on so it's that right okay so we've got um again the minimal stage directions as well a little bit wonky there we'll just adjust that the minimal stage directions so we have yeah uh yeah flushes as in he goes red is embarrassed so again thinking about voice thinking about the character david sider creating these characters lionel really is making Bertie uncomfortable with the level of formality that he's not used to. And that is how David Sadler, Sadler sorry, is having Lionel have control of this conversation. Uh, so you've got a minor sentence there. Perfect. In here it's better if we're equals. 
then if we were if we were equal, I wouldn't be here. I'd be at home with my wife, and no one would give a damn. You could say David Seidler here is establishing a sense of voice through uh, Bertie's frustration and his uh, because his social position means he's got to care about this. He's got to get this stammering um, fixed for his public role. You know, he's highly probably the most public role a person could ever have. And also, I think there's a sense of him being an ordinary person created with things like, yeah, so you've got just simple stuff here, like the noun, like wife, and you know, or the determiner, the determiner, and possessive determiner and wife there. Um, and no one would give a damn. That's an idiomatic phrase as well, a colloquial idiom as well. So I think it's establishing Bertie is just you know, behind all the formality, behind all the status. Really, he's uh, he's an ordinary human being with with fears and concerns and a life, you know, like everyone else, really. But he's got this position, which means he's not a normal person in that kind of way. And part of him would like to just be a normal person in inverted commas. Uh, Betty starts to light a cigarette from a silver case. Again, minimal stage directions there as well. Lionel, a very assertive imperative, don't do that. Bertie gives an astonished look. So again, it goes in with a lot of this idea of establishing character, establishing power in the conversation. You know who's the most powerful verbally, and then uh, you've got uh, where are we? I've lost my pointer. Sorry. Then um, I'm sorry. Sucking smoke into your lungs will kill you. My physician said that. Actually, before I do that bit, I'll do that bit. Sucking smoke into your lungs will kill you. It sounds hyperbolic, doesn't it? As well. I mean, it does kill you but it sounds hyperbolic, so the effect... And also, at the time when the film set, uh, it wasn't widely believed that smoking was harmful. Then, uh, my physicians... That's a very formal word, isn't it? Uh, or a lexeme, if you prefer. A very formal lexeme, or a formal lexical choice to describe doctors. Again, that suits Bertie's usual uh, social status. His comfort zone is in a world of formality. My physicians say it relaxes the throats. They're idiots. So we have a simple sentence, a very short, simple sentence, where Lionel establishes his authority and it's not what he's used to at all. But he's getting used to it by the end of the sequence. You can see there. They've, they've all been knighted. Makes it official then. And this is probably the best bit to talk about here as well. My castle, my rules... So there's parallel phrasing there as well. And actually you get a lexical choice from the world of the monarchy, isn't it? And actually you've got castle knighted as well. You could even argue that maybe, but those particular two, there's a link there between those two lines, those two turns that are made. And it's Lionel establishing that in this environment, I am the one with authority. And it's what he needs. And you see the film, it all kind of works out well. And, you know, spoiler alert. But I am going to stop now. Hopefully you found that useful. And there's all the other videos as well. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And hope you find it useful. Goodbye. <laughs>